Guard, Colorado College, and Oglethorpe. And we will uh, proceed through the D3 playoffs as well. It's the last half hour of the show on Thursday, which means one thing. We get to check and see what cup of coffee Nico is on. So what cup of coffee are you on, sir? Two? What is going on, John? ATL, SDH family. Happy to be here. This is number two, but it should be number three. Obviously, a little bit behind here today on schedule because my oldest son forgot his football bag. Uh And I had to go all the way down to the high school, drop it off, trying to wait for him to run up these stairs. So uh, I'm back, though. We are here, ready to go. Second cup of coffee, but I'm going to need to put another one on an IV bag or something, stick it to my... I just have this vision of an IV bag hovering behind you there on set, just like, you know, like right over your right shoulder and just takes it intravenously. Uh, I need one, man. You know, it's Thursday, so I'm going to be busy. So, yes, I, I, I need to look for one and, and get it my way. All right, let's work backward here. Uh, we've had another coaching change this morning. Aaron Lasada out at CF Montreal. And we had an announcement a couple days ago, back on Tuesday, where now you have uh, Phil Neville as the head coach in Portland for the Timbers. We can take them one at a time. Aaron Lasada out in Montreal. That happened while we were doing the show this morning early on. Early thoughts about Aaron Lasada out in Montreal. I think it's a mistake. I think that it shows us that franchise inability to plan for a long-term process and give a coach, whether it's Nancy or whether it's Losada or whether it's whoever, have enough time to set a program, set a relationship with these players, see what young players can develop, uh, provide an identity. And that's, impossible when you are having this rotating door of coaches and Losada, I thought he did a great job. I mean, he had this team close to the playoffs when there were many people that were thinking that that team could get as far as they did. And then is Will Nancy, ironically enough, who shuts that door right in front of the, uh, <laughs> the club there at the end of the season. But, All in all, I thought that, yes, there was ups and downs for Montreal, but at the end of the season or even midway through, you could see what Losada was doing. He is a guy that, regardless of what you might think of him, and even me, I have my doubts about him. I'm not going to lie to you, but uh, he is uh, very determined. He's very sure of what he wants. He wants uh, a flying team where everybody's running, everybody's pushing. Um, He is goes as deep as to what players are eating, what they're doing, culture-wise. So I thought he was a guy that if you gave him some time, if he earned the possibility to be there next year, he should have. And I thought he earned it. And even then, you decide to let him go. I I just think he talks badly of a team that has not been able to keep absolutely anybody in that position. All right, so let me walk through this and let me see if I'm wrong. And talk to me like I'm six. So Aaron Alasada is a dude that wants to do things a certain way. He's got a system. He demands a lot out of his players when it comes to their physical abilities, their endurance. I mean, there were the quotes about, hey, he's having us eating things, and here's what we can eat, what we can't eat. So he's a system guy, and he goes into a situation where it's square peg round hole. You've got to want, you've got to have the opportunity to bring in your guys. Basically, he has his system. He has to impress it upon the current roster. There's only certain things you can do with this roster. And so he barely misses out on the playoffs with his system, not his players. You gut the roster, and then you don't give Losada the chance to work the roster the way that you want to get the players you need to work the system you have. And you're like, if you're Joey Saputo, it's just like, well, you didn't make the playoffs. Eh. Am I wrong? Yes. 
Yeah, exactly. And and if you had that expectation that you were delusional, and if you had that expectation that you didn't see the players that went in and out of this team, and uh, you have to understand that there is a learning curve for players, a learning curve for the coach. You you switch into a total different system that you were working with last season. So I just think it it is unreasonable to think and set that expectation for him. And again. Every single club takes some time to vet through, I don't know, let's say five, six, seven candidates. You know what each one of those candidates have to offer. You knew what Losada had to offer, and you decided to bring him along. Then in, in, in I don't know, my mind, I'm thinking, well, that's because you like whether it's A, B of what he was doing or A and C, but you wanted to have that here. And again, he delivered to – most of the season so why not keep him does that say that you chose the wrong guy that you basically spend a whole bunch of time thinking about bringing a coach and then you made the wrong decision it just it all talks badly about montreal as an organization and that's it when you look at joey saputo this this fits his his mo it's like i want instant results and if you don't give me instant results then you're gone it's almost like and this will be the google search for today kids the relationship between George Steinbrenner and Billy Martin with the New York Yankees. Unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be seeing coaches continue to go back and be coaches for Joey Saputo. But it does make you wonder if you and, – and, and I will stipulate that, yes, Ernan Lasada is a prickly man. He is a very prickly manager, and, yep. does, and that's just how he's wired. But what this does is it continues to have people ask themselves – do I want to be a part of any of that ish with the owner being who he is? Do, you know, do I want to weigh the idea of being a head coach in Major League Soccer, dealing with the ish from the owner on a daily basis, or do I just want to go someplace where I can do what I want to do and I don't have to deal with all of that nonsense? Absolutely. And, and again, look, this team even added some pieces late in the season that – you know, have to get used to what you're trying to coach. They had some good results, right? I thought Okopu uh, was a very good acquisition, and you had the do uh, Duke deal. You had all these other players that that were brought in and and, and helped this team, Lasseter. And uh, at the end of the day, they adapted very quickly. And you have to say that's part of the coaching strategy. That's part of the coaching mentality. And you got these guys bought in what you wanted to do. Again. Columbus closes the door on you. Columbus is a top team. Columbus is over here playing the playoffs. So are you judging him on the 2-1 loss at the end of the season? Because that seems unfair. Because he was obviously fighting out of their weight class and still was able to keep it close. So I, I just believe that Montreal really needs to figure out where they want to be because everything that they've done – uh, whether it was bringing Henry or uh, uh, bringing Lasada, just nothing seems to work long term, and that just doesn't talk well about a franchise. Simple as that. All right, so then now let's go to the West Coast and, and uh, the coaching hire and the press conference that you saw earlier in the week. There is now a Neville in Portland. It has been catching a lot of grief from a bunch of different angles, supporters groups. I know that you've been critical about the hire. For those who haven't had the chance to go down your social media and, and check in what you've been writing on the subject, what have these last couple of days been like for you with Neville now being in charge in Portland? Yeah, I just think that there's been a lot of frustration and understandably so from fans, from that Timbers Army that is as committed, invested in a team as any uh, in the world. And they don't just want results on the field. They have a mentality of the values of the club, like every great supporting group does. And the fact that they've had to deal with so many domestic violence issues, how the team has handled it in the past with Andy Polo, uh, with other players, with uh, problems within the organization and very sexist and inappropriate behavior as an organization and you're going to bring in a guy that has some scandals of his own i thought it was odd and it was unnecessary because 
it's not like Phil Neville is coming in with this fantastic trajectory where he was unbelievable at Inter Miami and just showed you the display of soccer he could do because he really didn't do that. And I thought he struggled many times just making simple decisions on formations, on how to put players in positions that they could uh, perform, on handling the locker room. So with all that said, why take that gamble and not just go perhaps with a guy that's within the organization, right? They have some assistant head coaches, leave the interim head coach and allow him to continue to build. And if you're going to go out of your way and get a guy from outside the organization, then get a guy that's worth it. Not just the name, not just the smoke screen of saying, look, we got Phil Neville, Manchester United, and he's Beckham's best friend. Whatever it is that you thought was going to be great about him, I just don't see it. I don't think he fits in with the type of players that they have. I don't believe that he fits in with what Gio Savarese kind of left and even the interim head coach left. So now you're switching 180 degrees. You're going to want to do things differently. It's going to take some time. And when you have a team like the Timbers that has high expectations that have always been a team that is expected to be in the playoffs. I think you're in for some serious tough times ahead. And, and uh, we, we both know that that's unacceptable for Portland fans. When, when you mention tough times in Portland, that's unacceptable for them. Let me then, who would you have, who, who would you have had as your top contender there? Who would you, with those players they have on hand with some tweaking in the the winter window who were your contenders for that position that that uh, that phil neville eventually took oh that's a tough one because you know i i have a lot of guys from like south america fabian bustos uh, is a guy that i, I was kind of looking towards coming towards mls mm-hmm. um i think a guy like juan carlos osorio would be very interesting um i would go that route i mean you have such um dominant latin hispanic locker room uh you have a lot of these guys that have a lot of potential so i think if you go with an experienced guy out of this league uh, you bring in not just a different method methodological process about how you handle the game but you also have a guy that's going to come in and understand and know how to handle a locker room with as many stars as you have and you might be able to catch the uh the league by surprise. I've always thought that whenever you brought in the right guy from abroad, it, it creates a, a different aspect of, of you as a team. And that's what Portland needed. I mean, they, they just needed a whole different way of looking at things. And now they're just recycling from the bin that uh, Miami decided to just drop outside and never, never got picked up. So th- th- that's exactly why I believe that I would have gone and look for a guy, whether it was South America or Liga MX, a guy that's experienced, that that had a, a lot of real time as a head coach, and that could come and handle this locker room, and, and that could just turn it all around because you saw that this team has the quality whenever they're playing in one direction, and, and, and there is no problem, so that animosity within the locker room, they showed moments of that at the end of the season uh, once Giovanni Savarese left. So I thought that that's what they were going to do. But if there's something that Neville didn't show you was that, that he was unable to handle really a locker room to create something different, a culture. Uh, otherwise, he, he would have remained. And not to mention the fact that he would be the guy that I don't know if, if, if this is an ability to handle criticism, but many a times, how many times do we see him talk to the press the wrong way because he couldn't take the heat? If you can't take the heat in Miami, you better watch out because in Portland, even in this particular press conference, they were asking all the right questions. Later down the line, whenever you're coming in frustrated from a bad loss or a bad result, Phil Neville better check himself before he wrecks himself. <laughs> Ten games under five hundred. With a with a gutted roster in uh, in Miami before they brought in Tata Martino, uh, we've had some playoff games happen over the last week. Uh, Nico Moreno hanging out with us from uh, Pulso Sports in the Soccer Bar for his normal Thursdays with Nico visit after racing in from a rescue mission at the local high school. So that, that's always good stuff. Uh, Rave Green Mug on, on Cup Number Two. We've had some series close out. 
Uh, purple team closes out Nashville. Nashville apparently uh, decided to leave their offense home starting <laughs> basically the end of August, September, and I, well, or, or end of September. So let's say that end of September, October, November. The the offense was basically told, "Now nah, you guys can go on ahead and go watch college football on your Saturdays. Everything's cool." And then uh, Philadelphia beats New England. We'll get into what happened there last night. But from the, the uh, last week that was in the, in the uh, Major League Soccer playoffs, what are some of your big takeaways before we dive into specific? I just think Orlando keeps trucking along, and it wasn't pretty, and it wasn't amazing, and it wasn't fantastic soccer all throughout. But whenever you have a KG team in front of you that is going to make things rough, I mean, that those first 25 minutes of that game, I thought there was going to be at least three red cars. I mean, there was pushing, there was shoving, there was screaming. Uh, so it, it was played at a high intensity. You know, it kind of gave me uh, Copa Libertadores feel there for a second. Uh, and, and, you know, props to both teams for handling it that way. However, you said it. I think the real difference for Nashville was their inability to score and their inability to, even in the moments where there were chances, just taking care of this. Um, we talked about the Mukta dependency. If there's a guy that's going to make sure that he takes away your highway, your carpool to success is Oscar Pereja. And that's what he did. He absolutely overpopulated the midfield. He was not allowing Munter to get into service. Every time that he would get into service, he was really, really out wide because uh, I, I think if there was some of the issues that this team had was also they missed Dax in the first game. Dax in the second didn't look 100%. Shadowberg was another guy that did a lot for them in stretching defenses, and he wasn't available. Uh, so there was a lot going on for this Nashville team that was always limited on the defense, on the offensive end, and even more when you don't have certain guys. Now, I'm not making any excuses for a guy like Sam Serge that was supposed to be the savior of this team, that you brought him in to score goals. He didn't quite do that. Fafa Picol tried. He had the intensity. He had the intent to do a lot of things, but the, the finishing touches just what quite weren't there. And on the other hand, Orlando with the press, with that midfield, that center midfield that gives you so much equilibrium, uh, they, they just took advantage of things. Easy goal. You cannot give Orlando an easy goal the way you did to Angulo. Coming out from the back, making it easy for them. They get that first score early in the first half, and then it's over because then Austin could just manage the F out of this game, a and he did. He managed it perfectly, and he has guys that can do it. And if you want to go in and get rough and with your chest out against this uh, Orlando team, they got guys with like Araujo and like Cartagena, and even Facundo Torres was out there sticking out his chest. So – Godoy wasn't able to do much in the midfield. I just thought Orlando handled it well. They were better at the end of the day, and the one goal was enough. So they keep trucking. They're a team that is looking pretty good just because of their ability to just win games. So two questions, and they're, they're both along the Nashville bit. Does Gary Smith stay? Has he earned another year? And does Hani stay, or does he go? Because we knew of Qatari interest. If I'm Hani, how frustrated am I about what's going on around me or what not what is not going on around me? Do I jet? Do I stay? Do I hope that Nashville invests more resources around me because some of the investments this past season didn't work? What's your gut about what happens in Nashville now? It's a very good question. Uh, I would be more inclined to say that uh, Gary goes and not Mukhtar. I've seen him very vested in his team. Uh, he seems to like the city. He has a relationship with the club. He is the face of the franchise. Uh, so why leave? Uh, why go elsewhere? Uh, money aspects, yes, perhaps. But I think when you're in a league that is growing as MLS has, that has so many eyes upon it, uh, in a city that, you know, you have the keys to the city. Mm hmm I don't I don't really see a reason to leave, right? I do believe and I do think that this team understands today that what they have isn't enough and they're gonna have to get out there and build around Mukhtar and Sam Surge because I think he'll stay. He showed you glimpses of what he can provide, but you just need to refresh, you know, all my respect to Godoy. He's been a fantastic player. He needs some help. Dax, you know, those wheels have been 
looking to fall off that bus for a very long time, it's time to renew that part of the field. Mule, love his attitude, love what he can provide, but he's what I would look call a labor. You know, he's a guy that's going to give you a lot that, that you're going to be able to bring in and he's going to do a lot of stuff, but he's not a guy that's going to be able to carry these teams. So you just need to replenish that midfield and go from there. I think the back line is pretty solid. You keep more. Maybe you go look for somebody else from Lovett. You keep Zimmerman. Um, I even like Willis. So you can keep that, build around that from the back line up and figure it out then. But I would think maybe Gary leaves. Uh, I think he's done a good job at keeping this boat afloat. But if you want to take the next step, maybe you go somewhere else. Maybe you bring in a guy that's a little bit more uh, willing to just win games and change the schemes and be a little bit more of a gambler uh, and, and maximize your team in offense. Because defensively, they've been great. The structure has been awesome. But they've always been a team that just seemed like it was one step behind other teams. Kai Wagner was not present uh, on the field for mm. the match against New England for Philadelphia, which ended up being a clincher last night, 1-0. Mm. He will not be around on the roster, active roster, until a possible MLS Cup performance if Philadelphia makes it that far. He could go the way of Clint Dempsey in U.S. Open Cup if Philadelphia exits the season earlier than that. Wagner got three games for what he uh, apparently said to Bobby Wood. What would you think of that? Hey, you know what? I think that we're in day and age where you just need to watch what you say. And uh, you you know the rules. You understand them. You have to be able to just know better. Uh, in soccer, you will get instigated. You will get – that's part of the game. Uh, you know, you're going to get pinched and told and whatever. They're trying to get you off your game. And if you give a reason to – be out of the game and, and cost your team. I mean, you know, talk to me, ask about costing the team for just not being able to keep, you that's know, the next topic, a level head, then, then that's what it is. But uh, in terms of this game, I was surprised that Philadelphia pulled a result just of how the game went. And it was crazy to me because it was the refs who were playing with 10 players. So, they definitely miss, miss Wagner. I mean, he gives them a different player that can get forward, that has the ability to change the game on his own. Vizio does good. He He's a quality player, but he's just not Wagner. Um, Carranza was missing in this one. You're missing that X factor, that finisher up top. But it wasn't the quality in front that I thought was missing from Philadelphia. It was just generating soccer and keeping possession. Again, this refs team was playing with 10 players for more than a half, and still they seem to be the more dangerous team. So that just talks about what Philadelphia needs to figure out because it's just not working. If it wasn't for set pieces where they were very dangerous throughout the game, Philadelphia wouldn't have had much opportunities in front of goal. So I like that they switched the formation to the 4-4-2 diamond in this one. The three-man back line wasn't quite working, um, especially without Wagner. I get it. Uh, they, they had some possession, but it was so sporadic. And once they got pinned back, they gave the New England Revolution all of this space. I mean, in 2K, so, uh, uh, red card, it was New England who was in front. It was New England who was handling the business. Uh, then, obviously, there's some setbacks because of that missing player. But once New England Revolution was able to figure it out, we saw Farrell giving you some <laughs> real magic on that side. Man, but look, look, I follow Farrell for a very long time. and I knew his skills as a center back on the ball. He's very good on the ball. But some of those sprints, some of that burst, man, he was looking fantastic out there, man. I was like, who? Who, who is that? You know, I, I really didn't know. Oh, it's Farrell. Some of the, the shots he put on goal. I mean, props and credit to the New England Revolution to just demand his their team to go for it, right? We're going to add players up top. We're going to push our lines higher. We're going to try to find this game. And they made it interesting. However, obviously, this team uh, of Philadelphia with a great back line, with a great 
uh, goalie and, and, and a good structure ends up killing the game on a set piece. Uh, that's also very interesting the way it was taken to the first post, down low, um, and, and uh, Donovan gets at the end of it, puts it away. So good for Philadelphia, but it, it they get through. They get the job done. But am I more comfortable or confident with saying they're going to get far? No, I, I really don't. I think they're going to struggle in the next space, and they might not make it to that final. Because they'd have to get through Cincinnati, and Cincinnati won't have Matt Miazga. What was Matt Miazga thinking, allegedly? I mean, I have no idea, man. This is a guy that I just found out that eight of his 11 yellow cards have come of non-soccer actions. So you got to figure out what you're doing, man, because you're costing your team. What was the point of that? I mean, I, I just don't understand, man. You scored the goal. Good job. Get back, celebrate with your team. What are you doing over there? Just costing your team. It doesn't matter what you were doing. You were trying to instigate or, or whatever. You cannot put yourself in a position to cost your team. And it's that simple. It is that simple. Stay disciplined. Stay in the game. Have your mind in the final objective. Once the game is over, go do whatever you want. Go taunt. Go, go crazy. Go crazy and figure it out. But during the game, during a specific and key moment, like penalties, come on, man. You know better than that. You know better than that. But you just can't keep costing your team. But when I saw that stat, it just tells me that somebody needs to have a serious conversation with Matt Miazga and tell him, man, if you're going to continue to not be able to control yourself, I'm going to ship you out. It's as simple as that. Games three this weekend, it is Seattle and Dallas tomorrow, Houston RSL on Saturday, and Columbus and Atlanta on Sunday. What happens in games three? Whew. Some great games, uh, by the way. Um, the Dallas Seattle is going to be cagey. It's going to be, I think, slow. It's going to be a one game, a one goal game, whether it's a 1 0 or a 2 1. I think Dallas is going to come in here and play in a deep block, make it uncomfortable for Jordan Morris in this one. I asked Brian Smetzer this uh, week about Jordan's struggle whenever a team plays deeper. Because his forte is playing into space. He's getting behind the center backs. But when there is no space to run into, when you can get behind the center backs, his link-up play and hold-up play isn't his forte. It, it isn't great. His link-up play is not what he does. Um, so Brian seems very comfortable and confident that Jordan can do that. So if Seattle is going to be able to win this game, they're going to have to – they're going to need – Jordan Morris, to have a really good link-up play, hold-up play, be more than just a guy trying to get behind the defenders because Dallas is not going to allow you to do that in this one. I can guarantee you that. So can this team find the goals? Can they stretch out that defense? Can Leo Chu be as exciting and important as he's been in the regular season at times because he hasn't been in this playoffs? Can Nicolas Odero give you some magic coming off the bench? Can Nuhu not be as inconsistent with he had a fantastic game one he went in from a hero into a zero in game two so you need to really take this team and say there is no room for errors this is your home let's make it happen but but that's going to be an interesting one i still see seattle coming over with the win i do not want it going into penalty kicks because Penalty kicks have not been Seattle's friend in elimination rounds, whether it's CONCACAF or MLS. So I think Seattle needs to win it. I think they will win it in 90, but it's going to be a KG match. Houston RSL, I still don't know what happened in Houston. They did not look sharp. They didn't look fast and furious as they had in the past. Uh, the, the, Quinones wasn't able to make a difference. Uh, Coco Carasquilla had a couple of chances, but they just weren't able to do what they have shown you at the end of the season. And you could tell how frustrated Olsen was because in the press conference, he was going in deep on the reporters, basic questions, and he was taking it extremely defensively. And you could tell that he was just, ready to go he didn't want you to see it man but those cars that salt was showing also you got to be able to be better than that so i do expect houston to take care of this one uh i'm gonna stay with my prediction that they'll get to the end of the western conference final uh but it won't be easy because rsl they smell blood and they know that they can get to you saverino has been really good 
Uh, Chicho Rango had a couple of opportunities coming off the bench. He's going to be more rested, more ready in the second game. So you better be, you better have a game plan to minimize his importance in the final third. And then Columbus Atlanta, man, it has been fun. It has been as fun as any other game, more than any other game. Uh, I, I, this is the one I wanted to watch. I didn't care about the St. Louis, Kansas City. Uh, I, I, I wasn't high on uh, Red Bull Cincinnati. I wanted to watch Columbus and Atlanta because it was going to be fun, and it has been. Lots of goals, lots of great play. Gonzalo Pineda really put it together in this last game. And uh, the three acquisitions, I put that on, on, on social media. Gigi, Sava, Silva, all fantastic in this one. The connections, uh, Gigi's... Not just his ability to score goals and fly high like an eagle to get to that ball and that in his header, but it's the is the effort, is the commitment, the sacrifice, the defensive pressure, the way he comes back. I mean, man, he's a guy that you want to have in the battlefield, man. Just he gives you that sense of man, we, we're gonna leave it all out on the field, and he's making me nervous because I had Columbus moving on from this one and i feel terrible because i know everybody's like but gonzalo's your boy he he, he is because i i'm high on gonzalo but i just felt like columbus was a team that was hard to stop and oh boy did atlanta do it they took the ball away they were uh balanced defensively which gonzalo has been asking and trying to do all season they were dangerous out in the flanks Amada was doing his thing so i, I just Thing that this is this is anybody's game. Flip a coin, figure it out. Just make sure you're in front of your TV when this game goes along, because it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing. All right, what's going on, Soccer Bar and Pulso Sports? I know you got to have another cup of coffee before you, you tee off on that today. Oh yes, absolutely. We're gonna be there in about forty minutes. It's gonna be a good one. Uh, we're gonna have uh, the voices from uh, New England, uh, Philadelphia. We, we we got a couple of of videos and interviews coming in from there. Uh, we're gonna break down the difference between game one to game two of this Atlanta team. How game three can play out. Uh, we're gonna talk about Seattle. We're gonna see and, and try to break down exactly what it is that they need to do to beat Dallas uh, and how the rest of this Western Conference can go through. At Pulsar Sports, you can find uh, all the interviews that we had this week. Uh, we had Brian Smetzer. We had Jackson Reagan. Uh, uh, we had Alex Roldan. So go ahead and check it out at Pulsar Sports. All right, my friend. We will catch up again next week. We'll do it again at 1030 and 730, and hopefully we won't have to make the mad dash to the school to make sure that you hand off stuff that folks forget. Be safe, my friend. We'll catch up next week. Thank you. Have a good day. Nico Moreno, Pulso Sports and the Soccer Bar. See, he leaves our show, and then he does all of his prep for the next show in line when it gets into uh, his busy day. So uh, let's let's take the tour real quick and get into some of the stories uh, that we have. Uh, the FA is apparently reviewing Chelsea's TikTok of the Sterling missile throwing event. So during their celebration of the equalizer at Tottenham, uh, Raheem confident. Raheem Sterling is confident. He is uh, he is confident. He threw a missile that had been directed at the Chelsea players back to the side of the Tottenham pitch and not into the crowd. After the FA decided to review the incident, they were targeted the Chelsea players by a missile from the home crowd as they celebrated Palmer's equalizer from the spot in the four one win. Sterling can be seen launching the object back in the direction of the stands, but his intention was to remove it from the pitch. Both he and the club believed it did not end up back in the crowd. Should the FA agree with Sterling and Chelsea forwards, unlikely to be banned for throwing an object back into the crowd, which were Charleston and Didier Drogba have served, served suspensions for in the past. Caught on a video from pitch side, originated on Chelsea's own TikTok account, has resulted in the FA reviewing the footage. Under threat of receiving a suspension, if the FA does charge him, or Charleston got a one-match ban, for throwing the lit flare back into the crowd for Everton against Chelsea in May. Drogba got three in 2008 when he, when he threw a coin at Burnley fans during their League Cup defeat on penalties. Mickey Van de Ven unlikely to play again this year for Spurs with uh, the injury update there. Well, obviously, we'll keep an eye on that. The Women's FA Cup prize fund is going to double to nearly £6 million. Pounds. That is, uh, that's good uh, news there. Uh, Manor Solomon has uh, been suspended from Instagram. Uh, Spurs winger Manor Solomon suspended from Instagram after a pro-Israel post from Matt Law at 
the uh, Telegraph, and this was yesterday. Uh, Instagram account suspended after he used it to show support for Israel. Telegraph Sport can reveal that Solomon, who is currently injured, found out his Instagram account was deactivated while in Israel after being given permission to travel back to his home country by Spurs. Spurs quickly got in contact with Meta, and Solomon's account was restored Wednesday afternoon. It was deact after it was deactivated earlier in the week, prompting strong criticism from the Israeli Football Association. Meta denied Solomon's account was suspended as a result of any of his posts, saying, quote, Solomon's account was removed by mistake and has been quickly restored. His account wasn't removed because of any content he has shared. Tottenham got a, a, an apology from Meta to pass on to Solomon in Israel. No more detailed explanation for why or how his Instagram account was suspended. Uh, Premier League clubs are going to vote on a rule that will block Newcastle's move for Ruben Neves. This comes from, uh, from Tom Morgan. Rules around deals between associated clubs already apply to some degree on permanent transfers, but this would tackle loan moves. Uh, Neves' potential loan to Newcastle could be scuppered, the word from the Telegraph, as Premier League clubs vote on whether to fast-track a ban on such deals between associated clubs. A temporary measure which would stop incoming loans will be raised at the next shareholders meeting on November 21st, while talks continue over long-term solutions, claimed privately that the measure is not specifically designed to stop Newcastle signing Nevis. However, the Telegraph reported on how rivals would have been furious at the prospect of Al-Hilal loaning Nevis to Newcastle. Both teams are owned by the PIF. Associated party transaction rules already apply to some degree in the transfer of players on a permanent deal. Newcastle had to demonstrate to the Premier League that they had obtained fair market value when selling the winger, Alan St. Maximin, to al Lee, another PIF club back in the summer. Now there's a movement within the league to introduce an extra temporary measure. Not extra, te not extra temporary, but extra temporary measure to protect the integrity of the competition with longer term, while longer term solutions are established. So uh, Nevis was linked to... Newcastle after joining Al Hilal from Wolves back in June after the Sandro Tonali suspension. So that is where that is uh, coming from. Uh, let's see, trying to quickly see if there's any other uh, news. Ben Rumsby, the Telegraph Premier League managers are demanding changes to VAR after Mikel Arteta's outburst. No real surprise there. Uh, Sam Dowling at the Telegraph has, this might be requested required reading uh, for the day. Uh, Champions League article on how the sexting scandal sent Ajax into a free fall. So we'll post that into the uh, the comments on the Twitch pitch, and that'll be the requested required reading of the day. Uh, checking to see what our friends at The Guardian may have uh, up their sleeve this morning. And once again, subscribing to both. So we'll see uh, what, uh, what continues there. Apparently there is no space for Raheem Sterling in Gareth Southgate's squad as he's trying to piece together his uh, his squad to go forward. Uh, Real Sociedad vows to take legal action against Benfica fans from Sidlow at The Guardian. Uh, Benfica President Rui Costa has apologized to his Real Sociedad counterpart after visiting supporters through flares onto home fans during the Champions League match Wednesday night. Also troubled in the streets around the Reale Arena before the game with a group of around 50 ultras throwing fireworks and sticks. Ten people needed medical attention. Four arrests have been made so far. Real Sociedad President Jochen Aperibe. We will pursue them legally. If these delinquents have to go to jail, they will go. Anthony Taylor had to pause the game in which fireworks were thrown onto the pitch during the match. Sociedad won that one 3-1. Flares were also thrown from the away section onto the home supporters below. Mikel Marino said afterward there had been moments when the players' minds were not on the game. So we'll keep an eye on that with... Uh, with Benfica and Real Sociedad hop happening uh, yesterday. Uh, news for Jessica Charman. Government plays down hopes that Reading could be a test case for a football regulator. The culture minister cannot commit to, a, to the pilot for the League One club, an independent regulator uh, set to be established by January of 2025. So... Uh, we'll keep an eye on that when it comes to Reading and all of their problems. Like I said, Jessica Charman, hopefully we can have her on early part of next week, and we'll discuss that and everything else that's going on. And uh, 
cannot commit to using Reading as a test case to see how the proposed independent football regulator would operate. The culture minister, Sir John Whittingdale, has told Parliament he hopes the new regulator will be established quickly before the next general election, which would be held by January of 2025 at the least. Whittingdale said football clubs such as Reading that are in financial turmoil will continue to inform policy and development and decisions about how the regulators set up, but he couldn't commit to a pilot scheme at this point. Once again, they've docked, been docked four points so far this season for various financial breaches, recently referred to an independent disciplinary commission for continued non-payment of debts owed to His Majesty's Royalty and Customs. That is the English version of the IRS. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that when it comes to uh, the Reading situation. And we'll keep an eye, obviously, on the Reading situation and let you know what's uh, what's going on there. I'm trying to see if there's anything else to discuss. I think we're okay. I think we're good. Uh, obviously, the big news this morning, it was uh, coaching changes in both USL Championship and Major League Soccer. Ernan Lasada out in Montreal. That was the big news of the morning. So we'll continue to talk about that and continue to talk about everything else going forward tomorrow. Once again, Thomas Rongen joining us at 10 o'clock to talk about the new movie. And uh, our friends from Beyond Goals joining us at 930. And uh, Prem and Proper in the NWSL uh, preview, review programming. That'll be out tomorrow afternoon as well. So a very busy Friday for us here on Soccer's Morning Show. So thanks to Nico Moreno, Pulso Sports and the Soccer Bar. Thanks to Kaylor Hodges from the USL Show. Thanks to John Bradford, the head coach of North Carolina FC. And thanks to Jake Levy and everybody at NCFC for orchestrating that early in the morning to help us out in uh, – telling the story of North Carolina FC as they won USL League One. So a big show, and thanks to all of you for hanging out with us, as you always do. We'll be back at it again tomorrow morning, 9.05, to get you ready for the weekend and a match with Atlanta and Columbus to determine who goes on to the Eastern Conference semifinals to take on the Purple teams. We'll talk about it all again tomorrow morning, and we will roll through it all as we do. Once again, thanks to all of you guys. Since it's the end of the show, this means I get to do the thing I'm going to do next on the board. Mucha plot to play it safe. We'll see you at 9.05 tomorrow morning.